Closing the healthcare gap, please welcome co-founder and CEO of Last Mile Health, Dr. Raj Punjabi, and Times Nation editor, Haley Sweetland Edwards. Hi, Dr. Punjabi, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's good to be here. Um, we have people in this crowd who have expertise in all kinds of health, as we know, um, everything from Fitbit to DNA. So let's start with the basics with you. Um, what is Last Mile Health and how did you get there? Well, I, how, Last Mile Health's focused on this, this critical challenge. We've talked a lot about today about innovations in medicine and, and a lot of what we focus on is how those innovations get to the people that need them. And when we, uh, you know, this, this, my journey to this actually was quite personal. My, my grandparents were refugees of the India-Pakistan partition, and my parents then migrated later to West Africa, to Liberia, which is where I was born. And when I was nine, a civil war erupted in the country. We were refugees, ended up resettling in North Carolina. And when I went to medical school, I had a chance to go back to serve um, the people we'd left behind. And when I got home about 15 years ago, what I found was um, a huge doctor shortage. We had you know, just 50 doctors left for a country of about four million people. To put that in perspective, it'd be like the city of San Francisco having just eight doctors to serve the entire city. So you can imagine, as I was seeing, if you fell sick in the city where the doctors were, the few that remained, you might stand a chance. But if you fell sick in remote rural communities where I'd been asked to serve alongside my colleagues, we were seeing people die from conditions no one should die from, complications of childbirth, malaria, HIV, uh, no one should die from in the 21st century, right? right. And, and so this basic idea that illness is universal and healthcare is not, uh, you know, we know that to be true instinctively, uh, really struck home when, when you look at these isolated rural communities that might be hours to days away from the very innovations we've been talking about here on this stage. Mm -hmm. um, and you reflect that this is not just one story in one country, but in fact a global crisis, then um, we wanted to act to try to address that issue. Right, and the cornerstone of what Last Mile Health does, and correct me if I'm wrong yeah. here, is facilitate the access of community health workers. Right. Um, and talk a little bit about who those people are. Yeah, yeah, so you know, we, we know that there, about half the world lacks access to healthcare altogether. It's important to understand the problem uh, as well, right? And, and, and we're talking about basic healthcare, like vaccinations. You know, an innovation been around for decades, but 13 million kids this year will not go, will, will go without even a single dose of one vaccine. And most of these kids are living in, in rural communities, um, be it in Africa, Asia, and some of them here in the United States, by the way. Um, so the answer to this is you first have to deal with the health worker shortage because that's a critical issue. It turns out we have the most massive health worker shortage now in history. Uh, that's projected to grow to an 18 million health worker shortfall by 2030 if nothing differently is done. And the conventional approach, and you know, a Harvard Medical School professor like myself, this might sound heretic, but it ain't just doctors, it turns out. Um, uh, doctors training more of them is important, but it's not sufficient. Most of healthcare is organized in a way that doctors do most of the prescribing and the power of diagnosing disease. And the problem is most of us are concentrated in cities, as I said, leaving rural communities behind. So we've said, you know, what if you could reorganize the healthcare system? What if you could actually uh, empower nurses to do more? What if you could even go further than that? What if you could um, employ local rural people or community members even here in cities to be part of the healthcare team, even people without a high school degree? And so that's what we do at Last Mile Health is we train community health workers um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just give you an example of one, so for those who may not be familiar with the concept, but um, take one I just worked with a few uh, months ago named Ruth Tarr. So she, Ruth lives in a village that's about six hours from the nearest clinic in the rainforest of Liberia. Had to drop out of school when she was um, uh, in the sixth grade because her parents couldn't afford school fees. She uh, didn't have a job until about three years ago when as part of a national program the Liberian government's put together, our organization Last Mile Health and the government trained her 
uh, has her coached by a nurse. She's learned the 30 most essential medical skills. And because of the revolutions that some of your companies are making uh, in, in biotechnology, this is a $1 rapid test kit for HIV. There's similar ones for malaria that Ruth has been trained on. She can put that in a backpack alongside a smartphone that teaches her how to look for kids with malaria or HIV or, or treat malnutrition. So we've been trying to scale this up. Uh, now when a parent is worried her, her child is sick with pneumonia, as, as my child was this past week in Boston, she can get a community health worker like Ruth, her neighbor, to come to the doorstep with modern medicine and her smartphone and provide care on the spot. Amazing. So how, how many hours does it take to train someone like Ruth and, and how much does that cost? So the, the programs range in, in Liberia, it's about 16 weeks in the state of rural, in the state of Alaska with the community health aid program there, the Alaska Native Health Service runs where I first learned about this model. Um, they do it in about 16 to 32 weeks mm -hmm. um, and they work at almost the level of a, of a nurse um, and they've covered 20% land mass equivalent of the US with a worker in every village in the tundra in Alaska. And they're doing things like dentistry to, um, you know, uh, screening people for heart attacks. So that sounds like uh, this isn't only something that we can do out of the goodness out of, our, of our hearts, but this is something that makes economic sense. It does. I mean, the data is striking. So when you think about um, community health workers, uh, this is a rapid way to create jobs. The health sector, as many of you know, uh, uh, actually withstood the 2008-9 economic recession. Health sector jobs kept growing, and this is a very fast way to create those jobs in underserved areas. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out for every dollar a country invests or a health system invests in a community health worker, paying them, supervising them, equipping them, you get $10 of return to society. That's jobs created, longer life years, and epidemics averted. Uh, it, you know, one of the things I'm most proud about what time's done uh, you know, we see a lot of covers on, on innovations and, and advances in medicine. A few years ago, you also ran a cover story on Ebola fighters on the front lines in the West Africa crisis. Okay. Really hits home now because there are our colleagues in the Democratic Republic of Congo who are, fronting, uh, who are fighting on the front lines. Well, those are these community and frontline health workers. And that was an, a crisis in Liberia and West Africa that cost our economies about $50 billion when you add it all up. So for tens of millions of dollars, or for a, thou a couple of thousand dollars a year, you could hire, train, and equip a Ruth to help identify these epidemics early on. And so countries, let me just say, you know, a lot of us are interested in outcomes as well. Um, this is not a poorer version of healthcare. The, uh, when you look at studies in Liberia, you see that one out of three malaria patients are being tested and treated by these workers. When you look in Ethiopia, these workers have helped uh, reduce under five child mortality by 60%. When you look here in the United States, uh, right here in Harlem, there are groups that are working on improving access to um, care for patients with diabetes, reducing hospitalization rates. Uh, and as I mentioned, in the state of Alaska, they've uh, scaled up uh, you know, a, a tremendous amount of services. So, so this approach of radical task shifting to community health workers, and let me say one level up to nurses and midwives, is important. Incredible. More Ruths. We need more Ruths in the world. So just one more question. Um, if this is such a good idea, it is economic, it has an impact, why, is, why hasn't this caught fire? What's the power dynamic? Well, it, it, well, there is a huge, uh, not everybody agrees with this approach. And sometimes it's, it's, it's uh, those in my profession, the doctor's guild, that get in the way. Uh, I, I was, uh, you know, if, if you look at, I'll give you one quick example. In the state of Alaska, the Alaskans um, help train community health workers out in the tundra to do microdentistry. So they fill cavities in those areas. These are sixth to 10th grade educated folks who uh, take a 16 to 32 week training and they get a little extra training. Well, they were sued for doing that a few years ago by the American Dentistry Association, and claiming that these workers were quite unsafe and ineffective care. Well, as in any trial, they presented the evidence that in fact the care was better. Um, uh, and they used telemedicine uh, to ensure dentists were supervising remotely and the Alaskans won their case. But the, the issue here is that the male-dominated professions um, are under-recognizing and undervaluing frontline caregivers, be they nurses, midwives, or community health workers. It turns out the math on this is pretty striking. Uh, the, this year, the World Health Organization released a report that said, if you count up the unpaid and underpaid work of community and frontline health workers around the world, most of whom are poor, most of whom are women, and most of them um, uh, uh, are still unpaid. Uh, it turns out that it's a trillion dollars. The poorest woman on earth, 
subsidize healthcare globally to the tune of one trillion dollars with their unpaid and underpaid work. That's, that's larger than the economies of over 150 countries. That's what a trillion dollars means. So when you ask why that is, uh, it does come down to this guild mentality that we have to break in healthcare. If we really want to democratize healthcare, if we want healthcare for all within reach of every last one of us, it turns out we need to help others partake in the work of healthcare. And so again, with the technology that's new, uh, if we can sh reshape our policies, if we can hire more of these workers, if we can advance what nurses and midwives do, as well as community health workers, I think we can get very far. And just, just last month, there's been some momentum around this. 190 governments came together not far from here at the UN General Assembly and, and made a, the first declaration on universal health coverage. And as part of that, they said they want to feature community health workers as part of a core part of their plans. Now, declarations are great, but it's not enough. Uh, never in history has power been easily granted by those who have it. It has to be demanded by those from whom it's been taken. So and I, think, I that's think that's the key thing that we all have to do now is really ask ourselves, if as a doctor I've never gone unpaid for my work, why aren't community health workers um, and nurses given the same recognition? To get and paid unfortunately, for that's where we have to leave it. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Bandabi. Thank you.